Maxwell and Melbourne Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. This is Nat Fife from the Fremantle Footy Club. Trent Cochin from the Richmond Footy Club. Scott Benderbury from the Collingwood Football Club. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Patrick Cooch from the Carlton Footy Club. It's Rory Sloan here from the Adelaide Crows. This is Tom Mitchell. You're listening to the Coaches Panel. Hey friends, you got MJ from the Coaches Panel. I hope you're well and welcome back to another Strategy Roundtable with just a handful of weeks left to go in your fantasy footy season. It's time once again I assemble a couple of members of the panel to help you through the last month of footy for your Supercoach Dream Team AFL fantasy side, whether it is single season draft, keeper league draft, or you play a salary cap classic format of the game, we've got something for you on this episode. Joining me uh, on the podcast yet again, as he does pretty much for the most times we do these strategy roundtables, fellow co-founder Rids. Hello, mate. How are you? Hey, buddy. How you going? Hey, it. listen, MJ, before you go introducing the next person, yes. okay, I just want to talk, I want to call out a couple of things. Here First thing is, how good was it having Matty Mottram on last week? That was he just did, awesome. Okay? He did a great job. You'll hear him plenty on the coaches panel in 2024. Yes. Yep. And I want to call out this second thing. Did um, Mini Monk get like, um, he's not allowed back in the country. He's gone over to Switzerland, done some skiing trip or whatever he's doing. Like he's just not allowed back now or what's the go? No, no, he's definitely allowed back. We'll bring him back. Just couldn't uh, align schedules uh, for this episode. But don't you worry. You'll hear plenty of mini monk over the so next So he's left weeks. us because he's been on every other podcast <laughs> in the last two weeks and he hasn't been on ours. Yeah, that's lovely, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, no, definitely not. We love we love the Harry Sheasel of fantasy footy, that is for sure. Uh, speaking of someone that we haven't had on the pod for a little while, you hear him a ton during the preseason with us during the 50 most relevant. You also hear him on the pod pod most weeks. We've managed to just sneak him away in between footy training, runs, running the world in South Australia. It's Louis. Hello, mate. How are you? Oh, it's good to be back on the podcast. It's been a minute, so uh, keen to talk a bit of fantasy with uh, the great minds of you boys. All right. There's a bit I want to get to with you, lads. I want to talk, uh, if you're a league-focused fantasy footy coach, uh, hang, make sure you hang around right till the end. We've got some advice that you'll get from both Rids and Louie that's going to help you with, if you are a league-focused coach, they're going to help you navigate these final few weeks as it comes to finals. I want to talk keeper leagues and specifically players that have elevated their positioning in keepers. We want to hit that. Don't worry. Both Kane and I, through the months of October and November, for our Patreons and Spotify subscribers, you get a podcast every single week from us. That's an extra reason to hang around in the off-season, but our top 50 keeper ranks will drop. But I want to get these lads' thoughts on keepers. And then I want to talk some fixtures and some matchups, but maybe not just who we think scores well. There's some other nuances that I know I'm keen to get both Louis and Rids's insight from. But uh, Rids, I want to start the episode in this space. Maybe not the most important, but probably it's the one that comes to mind first. At the kind of midway portion of last week's episode, the name of Matt Crouch came up and is in the context of trading out of Ben Keys. Um, We've seen now two weeks of some relatively good form from Matt. And I wouldn't say it's correlated. It's partially caused a downfall in scoring from Ben Keys. Is Matt someone that we should be highly prioritizing both now and into next year? Or or is it just a, okay, it's a nice little bump. Yeah, the guy can fantasy jog on. Let's look at someone else. So the interesting thing with Matt Crouch, and let's just look at keepers, for instance, okay, right now. So he may actually be on your waiver wire right now that's that's he just disappeared off the face of the earth you know so there's every chance he was there or thereabouts like he's you know people would have been thinking about dropping him and picking up someone younger like as the season progressed so have a bit of a sneaky and just make sure he isn't sitting there but let's look at salary cap so dt and super coach wouldn't go there don't want to go there who cares about that? It's too late in the season. No one's got trades to do that, yeah? Sure. That's, well, that's the long story short, yeah? But the vast majority of coaches like, are in that position, yeah. Yeah, and the vast majority of coaches are right to be in that position. If you've got any more than three or four trades, you're doing it wrong, okay? So let's look at AFL fantasy. Sure. 
I want to actually have a little bit of a conversation around him because there's a couple of things I want to just highlight, okay? Mm. He's actually playing okay football. He's looking mm. pretty good. He, Adelaide's come out and they pushed Melbourne all the way the week before and he looked great in that game. Mm. They came out and won the showdown against Port last week. Now, I'm not saying it was due to Matt Crouch, sure. but the reality is he was actually pretty decent. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for some sort of point of difference yep. over the last four weeks, he's got Gold Coast this week. Mm-hmm. Now, I think a lot of the narrative is going to be that Tuke's going to go and sit next to Rory Laird and, or whatever. Dawson, maybe. That's great. Yeah. Whatever. But guess who he's not going to go sit next to, MJ? 100%. Matt Crouch. Um, and have a look at round 24. Now, there's a big massive caveat. We don't know if this guy's got the job security to be there in round 24. Against the Eagles, you're alluding but to. Yeah. I tell you what, though, if he is, that might not be a bad little 700 stab in the dark, you know, hmm. option at getting 100, 110 over the next four weeks. And really, that M8 spot, that's up for grabs here. And I know Louis is probably going to want to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. But but someone like a Ben Keys, who's lost the midfield role, mm. it's pretty much gone to Matt Crouch now. Um, he's going to be the first one out the door, I feel, like when those small forwards come back in the next week or two. Well, Rochelle's so- likely back this week at time of recording we don't know chances are when you're listening to this you do know rankin's arguably another week beyond that so you're right within two weeks time we could see keys really fighting for that spot unless a a tag related role in the midfield or half forward line lands his way louis talk to me about this m8 space because everybody's trying to look for some separation and they're also trying to find some uniqueness and they're trying to find a player with ceiling. It, Crouch does feel like one of many players we could be looking at M8 and probably also F6 that could really help us a lot in that space. So talk to me about Crouch and then let's hit this M8 and then I want to move into F6. Yeah, well, I think Crouch is certainly viable. Uh, Rids hit the nail on the head that job security would probably be the main concern. I'm not sure where that lies at the moment, just because I'm not sure Adelaide expected themselves to be in this position. So I think maybe they were charging towards finals with a pretty young core. Uh, They tripped up a little bit and things started looking uh, a little bit haywire and then they get a few unexpected wins. And I think the showdown probably boosted their confidence too to say, well, hang on, we've actually got the squad here to, to push towards finals. And um, I think if that's the case, then Matt Crouch is probably a part of their plans because hmm. he's a senior player. He's turning 29 next season. He's a player that only two years ago, um, three seasons ago, averaged 105 for four seasons in a row. And it was really oh, only wow. injury that probably curtailed him, uh, a little bit of form and then um, a little bit of direction change with the way that the Adelaide list is going. So uh, as a scorer, we know that he can do it. That's a big tick. The price tag's a big tick. The role's a big tick. Uh, The only question would be, like I said, the job security. I think this is the time of the year where you can take a punt, though, because like you said, um, M8, F6, D6, they're all up in the air a little bit. I think Mm. the gaps between those positions and maybe your M20s, your F15s, your D15s, I think the gap there uh, is a little bit smaller as opposed to what the gap is at the top. So... In that case, I'd be looking at matchups. I'd be looking at uh, what players have been able to do before versus teams. There's a lot of players out there that just for whatever reason have bunny teams. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd be looking at getting creative with a VC potentially. So maybe there's a guy with 2% ownership that you can see punching out a 140 and he plays on the first Saturday game. Well, beautiful. Put the VC on him because as we've seen, the, uh, the difference with uh teams at the moment with teams looking the same a lot of coaches Mm. out there consuming the same information bringing in the same players a way that you can actually differentiate yourself is by having a swing at that vc that's a little bit more unique because uh i don't know about you i'm noticing at the end of every round that the difference pretty much is maybe one or two players overperforming or underperforming but the main crux of that is actually who 
uh, they've put the VC or the C on. Yeah, it's some good advice. Rids, I'm keen on this idea that Louis dropped so many little nuggets there of gold for people, but he's talked about these early round matchups and certainly for AFL fantasy. And the reason we're focusing on that is for super coaches and dream teams, you're likely, if you have a trade left, it's league focused and we'll get to some league advice in a second or it's ranking and it's basically just waiting for that last trade to make, whether it be an injury or, or something like that. But this idea of the early round matchups over the next two weeks, just purely focused on that. There's probably three teams, Rids, that we look at either from the Friday night to the early Saturday games, and that is Essendon have that. They've got the 145 matchup this week against the Eagles. They've also got another 145 matchup. This is Melbourne time, by the way. Uh, the next 145 matchup is against North Melbourne. You've got Collingwood, who have got the 435 matchup this week, and then they've got the Friday night matchup the following week. And you've got Adelaide, the 210 matchup this week, and then the 435 matchup next week. Again, this is purely Eastern um, standard time. Are there three clubs there that are really interesting to you over these next two weeks? Or is that just, oh, yeah, that just happens to land for fixture, happy days? Or is there something in these three teams, Rids, over the next two weeks? So it's a little bit tricky when you try and do it over multiple weeks. Right. Um, Because really, the thing is, it's going to be really tricky because there seems to be a very good VC option coming up over the next three or four weeks. Um, Like, you think about the Western Bulldogs playing Richmond tomorrow night, for instance. There's multiple options. Multiple, multiple options, okay? there's We're talking Bonds and Pearly. We're talking English. We're talking Toronto. We're talking, you know, whoever else. It might be a Trelaw. Mm. Everyone is very viable. Like Western Bulldogs, it could even be a McRae if you really wanted to do a point of difference, unique VC who who can do pop. And I know that sounds weird after he comes off the 60 or sure. whatever the week before. But the thing is, you're not VCing him last week. No, you're VCing right. him this week. And that's what people sort of really don't get their head around. Mm. Like, and I would, I reckon I about six weeks ago, five weeks ago, I called out that Taranto was going to be impacted by the return of Prestia and Hopper. Um, that has. midfield mix looked a different mixture over the last five weeks. Mm-hmm. It's, the fact that Dusty's running through there as well, more, Bolton. like, yeah. there's just, it's a different dynamic at the moment as teams chase finals, yeah? Mm. So so that's why you've got to be really keep it in your mind. But we're talking Essendon. Yes. The group think is Parish, okay, this week. That's he's probably the number one. Parish and non merit owners are, are probably heading both those ways. Okay. And justifiably so. Sure. Okay. But we're doing that on faith with Parish. Mm. Because the faith is Parish has beaten up the weaker teams previously sure. has a monster ceiling, mm. but we haven't seen it this year, have Not we? Really. Like we haven't actually like we've seen glimpses of it. We haven't seen the we the have. 2021, the 2022, where he's going on three, four, five week stretches of 110, 115, 120 plus for sure. Yeah. So we're taking it on trust. Mm. So this is why it's so interesting because other People have sort of missed all the other people. Like, like LDU's a big flavour this week again mm-hmm. for the third week in a row. Yeah. I reckon we've missed that train. That I train's it, gone, yeah? I think so. Yeah. yeah. So why aren't we looking for the new train now? This is the time of year that you can actually look at that. And that's why that M8 discussion's coming up. And it's so intriguing because that's the spot you can attack in. And who cares if they suck? Because it's only one spot, MJ. Yeah. Like, what's the worst case? We're talking about a crouch. We're talking about, uh, like, a Trelaw, let's, for instance. Sure. Or we're talking about an LDU. What, what's the worst case? 80, 90? We're only talking 20 points, yeah? Mm-hmm. It's not, it's not going to ruin it's your not, weekend. 
No, we'll, we'll pretend it does. We'll look like crazy when it does happen and they spit out an 80. We'll go, oh, my weekend is ruined and we're not. But really, the reality of the whole situation is nothing's actually, you've had a punt on being unique yeah. in one spot. Hmm. Go and actually play the game and give it a good one because, like, if this comes off, that might be a learning that with four rounds to go next year when you are in contention, that you can go, oh, you know what? It worked last year yeah. when I wasn't in contention. Why not? That might be something that you can attack in that one or two spots in your team if you are in contention next year. Give it a go, yeah? Yeah. That's so good. Louis, talk to me about this um, this fixture. It's it's a fascinating time of year, not just for, for fixture matchups, and I do want to unpack that a little bit with you both in a second, but from a pure footballing sense, these next two to three weeks – of fascinating uh, you've got St Kilda sitting fifth on the ladder and they are one loss away and one variable match up from dropping to eighth and then you've got arguably everyone from 14th in Gold Coast technically one spot out of the eight and so you've got eight or nine teams clearly finding it out for probably two or three spots in the eight and that has significant compounding issues for teams as they rest guys as they play certain things as they like i said there's six seven eight teams that are just playing finals footy a month out how much of a factor should we look at these sort of teams that are sort of ranked fifth to 14th and the and the critical matchups they have as opposed to not just the matchups, where do we start to bring bring these two elements of the game together to give us some kind of a leg up on the fantasy competition? Well, I think this is where you need to rely on your own sort of football now. So I think, right. uh, and I've certainly done it before, where you get so encapsulated with fantasy that sometimes you forget what's actually going on in the actual AFL competition. You mm. lose track of where's who on the ladder or, you know, you maybe write off certain players who aren't scoring well, but in fact, they're playing a different role and, you know, they're playing the best football they ever have. So I think it's important over these next couple of weeks that we really need to take these games into context. Mm. So uh, I know, for example, um, last week, uh, Saints obviously trying to make the eight. They need every win they can. There's a question over Rowan Marshall all week. Yeah. Um, I think that's where you need to just be a little bit shrewd and go, well, I'm, you know, unless it's, you know, critical and they haven't come out and, and said anything, then that's probably something that's just a bit of fluff during the week that, mm. um, that I, you know, maybe don't need to worry about, but I should keep as a note. That being said, the teams outside of that as well, uh, you want to be keeping track of too, because mm. the same thing can, can happen the opposite where, uh, maybe a senior player does get dropped and they bring in some young guys and they and they just see what 2024 potentially looks like, a new game plan, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's a tricky time of year. There's so many variables moving about. Coaches mm. are playing their own game. Players are also playing their own game. Contracts are in the mix, up in the air. There's just so many moving parts that it can become um, just really quite unpredictable. So... I think the best advice this time of year is just to stay uh, up to date with the news as mm. it comes to hand, of course, uh, and uh, yeah, just you know, making adjustments. <laughs> yeah, Rids, does that mean like teams like a a Gold Coast and Essendon and Adelaide? Maybe you could say Richmond. I think they're marginally ahead on, on the ladder in terms of points. Do they become teams that in a week or two you can't afford to jump on? as they drop out of finals, equally teams like a Collingwood, a, a Brisbane, Port Adelaide. I know these are teams that are now more fighting for positioning in the top four than anything else, but does where the narrative starts to land of finals, no finals, locked home finals, non-locked finals, does this either inform trade-ins as well as trade-outs for you? It goes both ways, yeah? Yeah. So often you find that, Teams that have been locked into finals will then start managing the load of the players to go into the finals to be right for the finals attack. Mm. But then on the flip side, and you mentioned an interesting team in that in Gold Coast. Mm. Now, I look at Gold Coast and think, well, if they are going to drop out of the finals contention, 
what does that mean for the caretaker coach? Mm -hmm. Does that mean, like, say, a dimmer hard week gets announced next week or the week after or whoever? Does that mean he's got some sort of say into trying a few things? We've seen Sam Flanders, who's coming to the side, has mm -hmm. been given more opportunity under Stephen King, and a lot mm -hmm. of people have jumped on. But could that work in reverse if that's not what Dimmer wants? Mm -hmm. If he gets named, it is a big if, okay? Yeah, lots of but variables you Does that about. work in – yeah, but he wants to see Jeremy Sharp get a game on a wing or he wants to see what Elijah Hollands looks like through the midfield. Or he wants to see a Took Miller tagging for the rest of the year. Mm. You know, whatever it – there's just that real dynamic. So it's really important, and Louis spot on, okay? Mm. you got to keep an eye on the actual football. What mm. is the team playing for? What are they not playing for? Are they looking at bloody new players, trying to find out whether they want to keep uh, one or two guys that are on the fringe of the, you know, keeps for the next season? Um, let's see what they can look like in this position, you know? Let's try a tall forward who sucks as a tall back for mm. the last couple of year, weeks. And we've seen guys like Liam Jones, like these, the other one, the Western Bulldogs guy, Josh Bruce. Go down they started injuries. as key forwards. Yeah. Yeah, they've gone down, but they've been swung into new positions later in the season. Himmelberg's a perfect example. From last year, He's yeah. been pushed back for the second half of the year because that's where he wants to play and they're trying to keep his signature. Yet the community was so slow on the uptake on that mm. that they missed that point. Mm. Like that's why you've got to still have that footy now around it and understand the situation and what that might lead in regards to roles and in re regards to opportunities the managing of loads, the managing of players, the mm. older guys. You've just got to keep an eye on it, yeah? yeah so, Reeds, in, in terms of jumping ranks this time of year, which we know is pretty much harder than any other time of the year, do you mm. think identifying role changes now, uh, whether that be a top eight side or probably more likely a bottom uh, ten side, do you think identifying those role changes is more important than ever now? It is. I actually do. And the fact that if they do well in that role change is the key for the bottom 10 teams, yeah? So you, let's look at it. Aaron Hall retired two days ago. Mm. So clearly the someone at the club has tapped him on the shoulder and said, no farewell game for you. It's time on your bike. You're not going to retain a spot. Sure. But the key thing from that little news is who is going to replace Aaron Hall in the next three or four weeks? Mm. And then... If he does well, that becomes someone on the top of your list for next year to like watch over preseason. Well, look at a Harry Sheasel, so for example. I think example. it's absolutely. Yeah, like a Sheasel, for example. It was in the preseason that Clarko moved him into the halfback role, experimented, hey, this works, and have held him there. Then at times, Ratten's flirted with that halfback, centre forward, centre bounce role. For me, he's a fascinating player to watch. You talk about Hall, this compounding move of the next month. Do they want a glimpse of Sheasel at half forward where he, he really earned his stripes as a junior? Do they want him in that centre bounce midfield and learning the craft? Or is it, to, to both your points, nah, Harry's going to be our long-term mover and shaker of the ball off half back. We're going to give him a month. So you're right. There's a lot to take out of this for this year and, and for next year. And West Coast is the one we really need to keep an eye on. Correct. Rightio. Because Shannon Hearns retired. We're probably going to get a few announcements over the next couple of weeks around things. But who is best served? If there's a young kid like a Brad Hoff, for instance, okay? Even Duggan, that, a couple of years Duggan. older. Yeah, yeah, even Duggan, you know? Let's keep an eye on these guys and see where they go in the next two, three, four weeks because that's they should be on the top of your list if they impress you. And when we say look at the news and keep using your footy now, hmm. don't look at Twitter. News. No, no. There's no. a lot of trolls <laughs> out there that just like 
everything – like it does my head in. Just look at the journalists and look at the actual press conferences of coaches actual news. and so on and so on. And talk actual to your mates. News. Talk to yeah. your mates because they're, no they're funny. watching football too and um, quite often your mates aren't looking at it from a fantasy perspective, which – it's sometimes a good thing. You, yeah. How's this player doing? Is he playing midfield? What, what do you think? Um, do you see him doing the same thing next year? It's, it's just about you know, uh, consuming what you can, but also being able to select what parts are important and what parts aren't. Because there is a lot of white noise out there, but there's yeah. also a lot of seriously great information that um, does catapult coaches up there. That's true. Sometimes not the difference. Filter it, yeah. Yeah. So, like, for instance, in our chats, okay, so I'm a big Richmond man. Lou is a big Port man, although he tells you he's yeah, not at the maybe, moment. Maybe formally, but, yep. <laughs> formally. Yeah, formally. He's now a GWS guy, okay? <laughs> Go Tom <Never> Green. <laughs> um, MJ, Go you're a big team. pros. Who did I ask last week about Matt Crouch replacing uh, Keys in that makeshift team at the moment entering finals? It was you, you yeah. know. Go and ask your mates. If your mates are really avid followers, they get on the forums, they talk all about their team, they will know what's potentially going to happen because they're the ones with the best advice. Like, they watch their team religiously looking for things to support. You know, we want to see a young kid come through. Like I said a couple of weeks ago, Sam Banks is a gun at, at VFL level, keep an eye on him. And he's starting to flourish. You could see it in the AFL right now. So right at the top of that list, depending on what happens with short and coaches, we've got a lot of variables there, okay? And that was but a move that happened, sorry, Reed, as soon as short right. was out, wasn't it? So it's, yeah. yeah, identifying that, okay, well, the main rebounder of halfback, he's out. Uh, Sam Banks has been banging the door down for the best part of 18 months. Uh, there's a it. bit of murmurs the weeks before. Well, oh, hang on. Uh, I might look at him as a rookie downgrade or hang on. I might just pick him up, pick him up off the waivers. Uh, and if he starts like a house on fire, then all of a sudden I've got a name and a bit of currency to trade with. And you know what happens next preseason? Now, there might be, an, I'm not saying I'm wishing an injury on someone, but no. if a Dan Rioli falls over or a Jaden Short falls over and you've actually got your eye on Sam Banks on your watch list already, mm. now he then goes higher on that watch list, does he not? Oh, yeah. Because he's screaming for it and he's going to have a full preseason that you know he may very well elevate because he's going to be more of a senior pitcher over that preseason in case an injury does strike. So, so true. there's a whole heap world of this. It's really true. And and classic coaches, are they've really switched on at doing this, but arguably it, it's the keeper league coaches that are much more used to the if this, then that, if this, then that, and, and, and keeping and identifying on players, sometimes to their own fault, um, being bullish on certain players. And we see such huge variables year on year that one player change, the dynamic of a player's relevance and ranking in a keeper league can, can really move. And so uh, I do want to ask you boys one other question before we wrap up the episode, but I, I want to stop down and, and ask this to you uh, around keeper leagues. Um, who's a couple of players that for you has had significant evolution in where they would be ranked in a keeper league now from this time last year, even at the start of the season, to where they are now. Now, I'll, I'll hand it over to Rids first and, and Louis can jump in second in a sec. To be clear, like I said, through October and November, Kane and I will give our Patreons at every tier level as well as our Spotify subscribers. We'll give you our top 50 keepers and we'll rank them into tiers for you. So don't you worry, that's coming in the off season. But Rids, give us a couple of names that for keeper league coaches, either they've got and they should up their value or those that they should target that for you have really elevated their, their value in the world of keeper leagues. I think, there's one that jumps off the page to me, okay, and that's a St Kilda defender who has just come from the clouds this year in incredible Wanganeen Malera. He's been incredible. He's just been incredible. Um, and as we've seen Sinclair moving into the midfield rotations more and more, we're just seeing this guy own the back line. He mm. just – last week, 
I th- actually, oh. I know that um, um, Sinclair was being tagged at the time, okay, but I actually thought there's a chance here that Finn McGuinness is going to go and stand next to Wanganui mm-hmm. Valera, who was impacting the game so, so much. much. Yeah. Like, it was just ridiculous. But he's definitely one that's just jumped off the page. Now, there's an obvious guy, okay? He's in his second season as a player. It's Errol Goulden. Now, third, if you had... Yeah. you oh, he's in his third, third year. Yeah, yeah. So what? I thought you are heading you big boss for a second there, potato. mate. No, no, don't worry about him. Um, <laughs> but Errol Gordon, okay? Yeah. Because what he's done this year is he will be mid only next year. Agree. There's no problems about that. But the thing is, he has shown a monster ceiling and he has shown the ability to average over a season to be regarded in a top eight discussion around midfielders like for the year Mm. so he has just i mean if you said that to me at the start of the year that he'd be a top eight midfielder, nobody thought it we did him in the the 50 most relevant he was in the 40s and politely we were mocked for even putting him in there um he's been louis and i had a conversation radio we saw the and i don't know if louis will remember this or not but we saw that 170 point practice game and everyone jumped on. So it just became easy just to jump sure. on and go for the ride with the Golden. But after the first month or so, he he was doing okay. Wasn't setting the world on fire. No. Was doing okay. Sort of his role was changing a bit into the forward. And Louis and I actually had a conversation in case saying, oh, we got sucked in by a preseason game. And Holden like, actually traded from hmm. Pod Pod as well. Yeah, many so did. It was- that's how dire it was at the time. He wasn't dropping 60s on your head every week. No, he was going it was, 80. It was enough to think that, you know, there's a bit that. of room to move here Yeah, at his price point. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's actually um, he's the one that's jumped off the page, you know, since that time. Hmm. Like, imagine if he puts a year together for the whole season of that form. Like... We're not talking top eight midfielder. We're potentially talking top four or five yeah, midfielder, 100%. you know. He, he has elevated to the point of, you know, when you're doing your rankings at the end of the year with Kane, MJ, yeah. and I've got no doubt in the world that there's going to be a certain um, son of a gun from uh, Magpie era. That oh, I thought you were talking about Max Michelaney for around number one. <laughs> He, yeah, he'll Josh be up Dacos. there. Like, yeah, um, I was thinking he's going to be a discussion around number one. Yeah. But I tell you what, I'm going to give you a bit of a handy hit here. Please don't disregard Errol Gordon in that discussion when you get there because, wow, way he's had that good a year that it's going to be very hard to not find a top five, ten spot, which is going to be really, really, because I don't even know if he was going to sneak into the top you know, 40, at the, you know, if we were having this last year. Yeah. But the fact that he's going to be right up there is just crazy. Yeah. It, yeah. He made the top 50 keeper ranks last year, but he, I think he was in the bottom tier. He, just for reference point, not just on that, but in his last six, five have been over 120, two over 140. So that just highlights that ceiling that Rids talking about about Errol. Uh, Louis, for you, throw a couple of names at, at uh, the community that, for, in your eyes, have had potentially some of the biggest bumps in their keeper value in 2023. Well, yeah, and sorry, just to back over Errol again. Yeah, um, please. I drafted him in a startup keeper last uh, beginning of this year with all my uh, in-real-life mates and was able to pick him up at pick 57 so oh, beautiful. Uh, at, with forward status. So uh, you can imagine what that looks like next year. It's it's probably top 10. Yeah, he's a first-rounder, I think. You could genuinely build that case in keepers for sure. All right, Louis, uh, who in you terms got? Of a couple of, in terms of a couple of other guys, I think Will Day has to be in the discussion. Mm. Uh, he's brought up in the preseason, uh, moving into the midfield, and I think most coaches raised their eyebrows and thought, well, that's bizarre. He's a rebounding defender. He's quite tall, quite mm. skinny. Uh, didn't really fit the bill, but went in there round one, uh, started like a house on fire, and has tapered off mid-season a little bit, and he's probably sure. found a little bit of form 
uh, in the latter part of the season. And that's off the back of playing a little bit of loose man in defense when the Mm. Hawks are in a little bit of trouble. Uh, And being Hawthorne, that's probably going to happen for the next, you know, two to three seasons at various stages stages of the year. Sure. We've seen what he's able to do as a midfielder. He's a 95 guy as a midfielder, 95 plus. But the ability for him to go back really shoots him up my rankings because if that's a guy, he's obviously a keeper. And if that's a guy that you can use with defensive status in three, four, five, six years time, Mm. I think he's also, you know, top of your line in that area as well so will day i think needs to be given um pretty Some high love. consideration i think he's someone that you will still be able to get for a little bit of a bargain next year yeah especially as he's more than likely just a midfielder next year now there's there's always things that can change over the next month of footy lots of people will, will be loving harry sheasel no not drafting mini monk the harry sheasel no doubt will clearly have elevated maybe we'll see ashcroft not go quite in the space that people expected to with that acl some other names you've got for us louis yeah, I've got Tristan Cherry. So yeah. uh, obviously has been sharing the ruck roles every now and then with Goldstein. Uh, went down with injury in round sure. one when he was on about 30 with about 10 minutes into the first. <laughs> uh, we know he's got fantasy pedigree. He was absolutely killing it in the VFL for probably two or three years before he got his debut. Came yeah. in, uh, didn't really miss a beat. And uh, I think he was going to hit the ground running this year. And he's probably someone who I think um, maybe would have a lot more value had he played the whole season. But I think he's just yeah. done enough for people to raise their eyebrows and see. I know classic coaches will be all over him uh, in terms of the ruck option next year. But I think for keeper sure. coaches should have their, uh, you know, they should be pretty interested too. Yeah. Because I think, you know, at 24 years old, that's quite young for a ruckman, certainly Definitely. a number one ruckman. Uh, he's going to be under Clarko for at least the next four years, you'd think. And uh, he's going to be the guy that he leans on. So uh, I'm pretty confident in Tristan Cherry. I think he's going to be a good one to stash away in your keepers. And then, you know, on top of that, you've probably got a couple of rookies. You mentioned Harry Sheasel. Uh, uh, Angus Sheldrick is one who mm. made his uh, return uh, yeah. for his second or third game mid-year and just hit the ground running, looked a yeah. million bucks and... Uh, you probably would able to get him off the waiver while mid-season. He's now someone who carries a bit of currency. Yeah, Wilmot's wind, another one. He might going. even still be on your waiver wire. Yeah. In which case, I'd be picking him up. Uh, Michito Owens yeah, has he's a absolutely shot the lights out, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him enter the midfield as well. With that forward status, probably for another season or two, yep. he's a good one to stash away as well. There's some nice names that are there. All right, boys, we're going to wrap up the episode in just a minute. Um, what I'm looking for, for people that are focused on their leagues, um, again, Supercoach Dream Team, AFL Fantasy, kind of irrelevant at that point, but can you give me one nugget of advice for a fantasy coach that doesn't give two stuffs about their rank, but all they care about is getting the dub over their mates in a league. Cash league or not, kind of irrelevant. What's your one parting bit of advice for coaches that have entered into their fantasy footy finals? And what should they be doing this week? Rids, what are you thinking, mate? I would find the most hyped um, player over the next four weeks and go against them. Uh, if you own them already, trade out of them. Like, and find someone with a better draw. Okay. Mm. So, there's a few little nuggets here. So, with the dogs, for instance, okay, Watson Pelly has been an absolute superstar. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Mm. But we often forget about a Trelaw or, a, you know, the others that come with it. Yeah. Because, like, we only got, like, a memory of a goldfish, and we can only remember this year. But don't forget these guys have been superstars for years gone by, mm. even like a Baz Smith. If you can just find that unique head-to-head matchup that's mm. in your favour and that you're comfortable with against, say, a hyped, um, let's say, LDU, for instance, and you sure. can have that matchup, that could actually win you a league title. Yeah. If it gets going. Yeah, that's really good shout. 
Louis, what's one last nugget of gold before we wrap up the pod that's going to help those league focused? Oh, I, I think Reed's hit the nail on the head there. You really just have to look at your league matchups, identify where the difference is, and then uh, really just have a crack. I think, like I said at the top yep. of the episode, that a lot of teams are looking quite similar. But I'll look at you know some of these top eight mids, and they're putting up numbers that are with the best of the lot. And some of their ownerships are, you know, uh, between two and five percent. Just to rattle off some names: Darcy Parish, one we mentioned earlier; Jack Viney, Tom Liberatore, mm. uh, Adam Trelaw is another one. Rory Laird wouldn't be highly owned. Uh, there's there's so many players that uh, Josh Kelly is another one. Uh, Tuke Miller potentially could be one too. There's so many players who are between two and five percent ownership, and even if they're not, there's a lot of ghost ships out there. Regardless. Um, that will give you that differential in your league matchups and might be able to to give you that extra edge. Yeah, some really good advice. You, you boys have been absolutely sensational helping people make some really informed decisions uh, as they head into the round 21 of fantasy footy. Louis, an absolute pleasure to have you back on the pod. We'll no doubt hear plenty of you. By the way, uh, just dropping some sneaky news. He's going to do a little cash cow early guide for us in the off season that you'll get. So Louis and I will be catching up. Looking forward to that podcast, mate, and having you back on this. So thank you, mate. No, thanks, mate. I'll uh, I'll send the invoice after this. Yeah, great, fantastic. Uh, speaking of someone that doesn't send an invoice, uh, is Rids, mate. An absolute pleasure for you yet again to have you back on the pod, mate. Hey, don't forget, just if you're a Patreon, make it a little bit higher this week, this month, okay, so we can get Mini Monk out of um, Home Affairs or Border Patrol or whatever it is these it's days, and get great. him out of customs to get him back onto the pod next week. That would be great. If you want to become a Patreon, all the details are in the description of this podcast. There's a heap of bonus content that comes your way, not just during the season, in the off-season and the pre-season. So if you want to join that Patreon, there's a tier that's right for you. All the details in the podcast description. Or if you just want to become a pod, a podcast Spotify subscriber, you can also do that through listening to Spotify. Uh, thank you for your support of the Coaches Panel in 2023. We hope this round... 21 is kind to you that it all lands your way and we can't wait to chat to you next week with another strategy roundtable.